Good evening, everybody, and, and warm welcome. End of a long day, and we've got a great topic this evening um, on agile governance. I'm Nairi Woods, and I'm Dean of the Blavatnik School of Government at the University of Oxford, and I'm going to introduce our speakers in a moment. But first, I want to ask all of you, given that our topic is agile governance, put your hand up if you'd like to see more agile governance in the world. <laughs> okay, so those listening but not watching should know that everybody practically put their hand up. Everybody would like more agile governance. Tell me, how many of you would like more inclusive governance? Put up your hands. Okay, so pretty much everybody would like more <laughs> inclusive governance. But we have a little bit of a problem here <coughs> because Inclusiveness usually requires something other than agility. If you're going to really be inclusive and really consult a community and really seek their solutions, that takes time. And, and it's very difficult. The reason why many governments or firms are agile is because they do it quickly using experts. They dive in, they do their thing and come out. So let's start by thinking about what the tension might be now, just one last question to our audience. When you put up your hand for agile governance, what, were you, what, what was in your head? What was the first thing that was in your head? Don't overthink it, but what was in your head which, which made you all go, yes. In fact, most of you were smiling as you put your hand up. So what was in your head? Ease of living. Ease of living. Quick turning around on the situation. Quick turning around on the situation. Mixed teams of public and private, government and private sector. Yes. Speed and variety. Speed and variety. Speed and variety. Yes. Zeitgeist. Zeitgeist. Finger on the pulse. Yep. Technology keeping pace with uh, regulation, keeping pace with technology. Regulation keeping pace with technology. There's a there's a challenge. Any others? So, yes. Efficiency. Efficiency. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So I'd like to come to some of our panelists. And I guess one of the first people I'd like to come to, just so that we can all wake up um, thoroughly, is um, Carlos Moedas from the European Commission. Um, he's Commissioner for Research, Science and Innovation, European Commission Brussels. I'm picking on you, Carlos, okay. because most of the world looks at the European Commission or the European Union and says that is the opposite of agility, right? We have agile <laughs> governance, and then we have this huge lumbering European Union that's the opposite of agility. Is that why you go to bed dreaming of more agile governance? That's what keeps me awake at night, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I, I think that uh, the way we live today is that problems uh, have no borders. And so if you try to regulate at the level of a country, it's very complex and very difficult. When you look at health, at uh, cybersecurity, they are all global problems. So you have to find solutions to regulate at the European level and also at the global level. But the European Union is a group of countries that decided to solve problems together. The problem is that was exactly what you said uh, in the audience, is how do you keep up the pace in between technology and regulation? And so far, regulation has been something that politicians do, normally uh, with legal experience, so lawyers. It's static, and it's about the past, and it's about the products. The problem is that the products of today are not the products of tomorrow and uh, you are regulating something that you don't know. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the experiences that I've been doing, uh, very simple in Europe, is creating something that we call the innovation deals. Mm -hmm. We copied that from our friends, the Dutch, that created this concept of the green deals. Mm -hmm. And it's about putting people around the table. So instead of being the politicians doing the law, it's putting the entrepreneur, the entrepreneur that has a problem, with a national regulator, with the European regulator, with the lawmakers, mm -hmm. and looking, why can't you go to the market with this product? Mm -hmm. And the most interesting result of that in Europe is that in the Netherlands, they got to the conclusion that in 70% of the cases, they really did not need to change the regulation. Mm -hmm. There was a problem of perception, of negative perception, that the regulation was 
impairing that person or that company to get to the market. And the other 30%, you had to change regulation, of course. But I think this, that's the challenge, is how do you co-create with people? And I think that somehow I'd like to challenge you on that being inclusive and at the same time agile. Mm -hmm. You can be both if you co-create together. Uh, and if you co-create with a system. And so I think that's really the challenge of the day for politicians. Politicians have to let go and to be inclusive to entrepreneurs to regulate that future uh, as we uh, see today doesn't happen in most of the countries. So somehow the European Commission and the European Union are a little step ahead, at least in the thinking of how to solve the problem. Eric, thank you. So. Even in the European Union, if I can permit myself there, actually everyone will accuse me of bringing a British perspective, so I won't. But you can, you can, um, you can, you can, it's by bringing regulators and entrepreneurs together and helping sort out problems quickly that yeah. you're saying is already making breakthroughs. Absolutely. Right. And, and there's results. So I'd like to move to Eric Brinjolfsson, who's director of the MIT Initiative on the Digital Economy. Recent reasonably recently published a paper in Nature on these, on these issues. Um, Eric, surely there's a problem here, which is that if regulation is constantly changing, it makes it impossible for firms to operate. There are, there are business leaders that would, that would say to me that they would prefer regulation to be predictable and stable than for governments to be changing the rules on them all the time. I think it's not a matter of stability versus pace of change. It's a matter of whether it's changing in sync with the needs of um, the, the environment, the customers, the business. Because uh, as we just heard, technology has never been moving faster. And that's going at, a, at with uh, artificial intelligence particularly, but digital technologies more broadly. We have rapid new business models, opportunities to create enormous value, more value than ever in history, but also enormous harm. And regulations do have to keep up with that. The issue, as, as Tom Mitchell and I wrote about in, in our Nature article, is that governments are flying blind. They don't have the data needed to understand what the opportunities are, what the risks are. Um, our data uh, gathering infrastructure is really something that was a wonderful invention in the early 20th century, 100 years ago, Simon Kuznets and others, but is not keeping up with what we need today. There's a lot of digital data we could be gathering to um, give us the insights. The, the issue is that also a cultural one, that um, both in, in a lot of big uh, private sector companies and governments, there's been a historical mindset of trying to predict and plan based on that. And that just can't keep up with this pace of change. You have to switch to a sense and respond mindset. And the first part of sensing is, is gathering that data more rapidly. Let me give you one, one concrete example, and then it'll be interesting to hear from some of the others. Um, the companies that are on the leading edge of this, many of the, the digital, born digital companies, Silicon Valley companies, are companies like, like Amazon, Google, Facebook. How do they do it? Well, um, they don't try to predict the future, um, even though there's lots of smart people there and lots of data. Um, they sense and respond. They do A-B tests. They do experimentation. One of, uh, Jeff Wilkie, one of the leaders at, at Amazon, came to, he's an MIT guy. He came to my office uh, a while back, and uh, I was going to have him speak in my class. But first, he wanted to show me something. He brought up uh, the Amazon screen, and he looked at it for me. He goes, oh, you're in Group B. I'm like, what do you mean I'm in Group B? And he goes, see, see the shopping cart is over on the right side of the screen as you check out. And uh, I'm like, well, what are you talking about? He said, we're doing an experiment right now on 100 million people. And uh, half of them have the, uh, the shopping cart on the left, and half of them have it on the right. And I'm like, why does this matter? And he goes, well, we're constantly testing little things, big things, our, our order entry process. And these A-B tests that they do is how they decide and how they learn what works. As it turns out, I guess, apparently having the shopping cart on the right gets, it makes you about 0.3% less likely to abandon the shopping cart. And they close those sales more likely. 0.3%. Who cares? Well, actually, that's an enormous mm -hmm. number mm -hmm. for um, a, a company that, you know, the, the cost of moving the bits around is very, very low. They are doing hundreds of experiments like that every day. So are the other digital companies to learn, again, some on big, some small things. I think governments and, and other you know, Fortune 500 companies, small companies, can learn from this mentality of um, using digital infrastructure to gather information more rapidly, be much more agile in responding to the environment, 
not trying to sit back in our room and predict what the future is going to be, but constantly be learning and updating. Right, but it's a lot easier in the retail sector well, that's a than in government. Easy one. So, so let me push you to apply sure. what you just said to some advice to Carlos Muedas, trying to get the European sure. Union's regulatory framework yeah. to so, respond to technology. Absolutely. So one of the things that the European Union does, the US government does, is um, there are decisions that affect um, hundreds of billions, even trillions of dollars worth of the economy. And sometimes they're rolled out and somebody in Brussels or in Washington makes some decisions. Um, there's an opportunity there to do, believe it or not, A-B tests or roll them out. This was done accidentally in Oregon, one of the states in, in uh, the United States. Um, it turned out that they didn't budget and they ha had the wrong, didn't have enough money to give everyone Medicare as, as they had, ex Medicaid as they had expected. So they decided we'll do it by lottery. And they let some people have it and just completely randomly other people didn't get it. Economists like me were ecstatic, because we, not, not because the people didn't get the Medicare, let me just be clear, but because um, we suddenly, for the first time, had an A-B test control data. We could see how much of a decision does this make to their health, to their well-being, to their care. But rather than doing that accidentally, you could, every time you roll out a new program, you could be thinking, is there an opportunity here to do it fa in different phased way? Maybe the first quarter we do it here, and then the other quarter we do it there. Of course, there may be interdependencies. You have to be careful about that. And then you would learn, and instead of people in, in, in Parliament or Congress debating what they think is right and, and having their opinions, you would have actual facts about what works. And how many people died? And how many people, in this case, actually, one of the surprising results was, well, I mean, it was a, it was a budget thing. It wasn't a, an experimental mm -hmm. thing. One of, the th one of the interesting results was that there was relatively little effect on mortality. There was a big effect on mental health and well-being and security. Mm -hmm. So that was something that, that people mm -hmm. uh, realized that this is a, an aspect we need to look at more carefully. Absolutely. Carlos, how does that advice sound to you? I think it's, a, it's, it's fantastic. I think it's uh, that in reality, uh, you have in the political world and in governments, uh, you don't have data. You have very few and you don't have access to data. Mm -hmm. and, and so as a politician, you struggle. And that's why you come with opinions mm -hmm. uh, and you try to yeah. follow your instinct that sometimes doesn't work. And so I think that one of the things that we really are doing also in the European Commission is to develop that scientific advice based on facts. So each time one of us around what we call the College of Commissioners, so the, the, the Commissioners for Europe, we have to have from our scientific advice members, which are the chief scientific advisors of Europe, data that will actually lead us to uh, a decision. Easier said than done, uh, because a lot of the times we don't have the data. We went from and the hippos to the data-driven. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Any questions? Clarifications? Yes. So the question is, can we do simulations? At, at, at times. I think that you'd be surprised. You can, do, you can get the data more often than you think. And I think most people don't think hard enough about how to run these. We sometimes work with workshops, and we get people to just spend a, a day brainstorming a lot of simple experiments that they can run. The other thing is you, you, in a, you gather, there's a lot of digital data that's, that's being gathered but not being uh, organized, aggregated, and stored in an efficient way. So governments can leverage um, company, the, the private sector, their own administrative record keeping. So yes, you can do simulation, but I would, my first instinct would be to push harder on, on actually getting the real data. But I think the less, one of the lessons Eric has drawn our attention to is there might be effects of your experiment that you don't set out thinking you need to measure, like the mental health consequences yes, yes. of the change. Yes. Common law jurisdictions with a federal structure actually have an advantage in being agile because some court somewhere makes a decision and then you look at the consequences and if it is bad, like you know, others do it differently. Uh, or, and as you said, one jurisdiction can actually make a, make a legislation and then you have a, almost a, a, a randomized control trial with the other state that doesn't have done it because I want to hear some of the other yeah. voices, but, but, but it, they can, but I think in practice they often don't. Um, when the U.S. Uh, federal system was set up, many people refer to it as laboratories of democracy because different states have different opinions and cultures, and, and some of them work better. In Kansas, they cut taxes. It turned out that it, it drastically reduced their revenues. In, in, other country, in other states, they do other things. The, the issue, I think, actually is as much a cultural one in terms of moving... Um, 
uh, we, we joke about data-driven decision-making, that the previous way of making decisions was something we called hippos, which is the way decisions have been made for, for thousands of years. And that is when you have an important decision, you get a group of people sitting around a, a table, and you all give your opinions and your judgments. And then you go with the hippo, which is the highest paid person's opinion. <laughs> um, and that, I guess, has worked tolerably well for a while, but we can move beyond that. But it's not so much a question of um, just having the data. It's also this cultural thing. And, and having those laboratories of democracy is useless if you don't actually learn from them. Great. Thank you very much. I'd like to turn now to Hermann Greff. Because if there was any, ever an embodiment of agile governance, meaning someone, a, a CEO, who picks up the latest evidence and science and applies it, Hermann, it's got to be you at Sperbank. Can you share with us lessons about have you ever had to learn to slow down in trying new things in Sperbank? Are there lessons that you would bring to us about how to make governance more agile from your own experience in your own, in your own bank and working very closely with the Russian government to try to make it more agile? Yeah, it's a, it's a very difficult task to bring somebody to agile practice before you uh, agile enough. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, for me, what, what does it mean for me, uh, agile? And I think all these things which uh, um, uh, was declared here, it's, 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 it's uh, right. But for me, the first issue, which is crucially important, this is the customer satisfaction. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would like to start of our uh, agile journey from the customer. And don't forget the customer. Every day we, we try to do the same. Start from the customer, from his needs, from his experience, and uh, what you you can do for um, achieving every day his satisfaction. And if your uh, customer will be satisfied, you will be happy with all your business numbers. And uh, if if you speak about the political results, I think it's. It's uh, uh, the social and political stability. The second one, um, what, what's the most important uh, resource for our customers? This is the time. We can have more, more money. We can repeat the, the, the inefficient experiments, but we can't. Uh, turn back the time. And the time is the most important resource in which we try to invest our money and our efforts. And we say that now we're not uh, only the bank which managed the uh, money of our clients, we would like to save the time from our clients. And uh, how we try to measure our agility. It's a two measure, measure, measurements. The first one, this is time to market. How fast we can produce the new products. The second one, uh, time to decision. It's, it's, uh, it's the issues how fast we can uh, uh, produce our decisions. And now we, we, we speak about real time decision making and uh, data driven decision making. Mm -hmm. And the third one, uh, this is the time to delivery. How fast you can uh, deliver the to your clients, your service, or uh, your goods. What's the main problem? If you speak about the new organizations like the, the FinTech or, or uh, the, the technical giants, they were born in this environment. They're agile by the uh, birth. Mm -hmm. But where the big organization like Sberbank, we have more than 300,000 uh, employees. And how we can um, turn ourselves to this way? And I think that uh, it's, it's a very good issue to everybody. We try to implement agile in our organization during uh, last uh, more than two years. And now we have um, around 60% of our, of our headquarters in agile. Now that we started with the second process to go to DevOps, mm -hmm. and I can say that it's a very, very hard experiment for everybody. By the first step, normally we lose 20% of our 
good management team. Mm -hmm. Uh, because culturally, it's very difficult. Uh, it's and could you just explain for, for all of us, when you say we've turned 60% of our workforce agile, so what, what does that mean? What, if I met one of those individuals, what, what would be different about them to the other 40% of your workforce? It means that, uh, first of all, we, uh, for that we, we uh, build a special building. Mm -hmm. It's 100% different uh, open space. Um, uh, it's, it's a very specific place in which uh, we constructed all four agile procedures because the culture is very different. They, they all the procedures are very different. And we divided the whole headquarters on the teams by 10, 12 persons, and we mix the uh, technological people, the engineers, together with the uh, businessmen and the, 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 the normal bankers, uh, what we call it. And now we, we can't call these uh, people as the engineers or as bankers. This is the, we call it the, the technology producers. Mm -hmm. Now they're producing, every day they're producing technology and they're improving the, the technology. And, uh, what, what uh, it gave for us as a first result, it's 100% transparency, because we can measure each team every day and the efficiency of each person inside the team. Mm -hmm. And uh, it creates a 100% different environment inside the team. And we, cannot, we, we, we don't want to manage the, the culture inside the teams because uh, everybody competing with each other because they, they, they have open mm -hmm. uh, uh, results and, and they can see every day on mm -hmm. uh, the screen how productive mm -hmm. is uh, his team and how productive is the, the team who is working uh, wow. uh, and, and, and the same. So, so you've got mixed teams, you, you've got them working in a different culture, in a different space. Coming back to your indicators of success, <coughs> um, has it surprised you? Are they, is it, are they really producing a whole lot more customer satisfaction and much quicker, time to market, time to deliver, et cetera? Or in some cases, is it, is it too soon to tell? Uh, as a first result, we have uh, increased our time to market mm -hmm. two, three times. It's very good results, but uh, but the result, but it's not enough to compete with uh, Google or Amazon because they measure their time to market with minutes. Now we measure our time to mar market with weeks, oh. and it's a huge difference between <laughs> bank and uh, high tech company. But if you look at our previous uh, uh, results. Our time to market uh, has, uh, um, uh, was between uh, six months, and f for some of uh, very difficult products, it took more than one year. Mm -hmm. Now we can measure it with weeks. It's a big jump. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a first results, we, we get a, a lot of satisfaction insi inside the team because the people understand that now we, the uh, more mo mobile, they're more agile, and now they can create uh, in the same period of time more services for our clients. And uh, as a second uh, step, it's, it's uh, uh, also customer satisfaction level. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Hiroaki Nakanishi, um, you're chairman of Hitachi. Yes. You're also the leader of the Japanese Business Association, the Keidan Ren. Um, I saw you nodding vigorously mm. during Hermann's description of agile governance. Is, is that working for you in Hitachi or across the businesses that you now represent? Oh yeah, that's uh, the, not simply of the AI <coughs> or big data analytics. That's uh, totally the digitalization is a very very important base for the uh, considering of everything. Mm -hmm. The the, you, you talk about some of the other, you know, bankings uh, or some of the services, mm -hmm. but now the, uh, the, those kind of digitalizations sometimes a destructive change of the business itself. Mm -hmm. How to reach the, uh, you know, that uh, 
the more smarter the so social environment. That's a kind of the you know, the target for the finery. From the viewpoint of the business itself, also that some of the uh, the nationwide the the social problems or issues to be solved, how to utilize of those kind of digital ways. Mm -hmm. That's a big issue for the current you know that uh, mm -hmm. agile governance. Mm -hmm. So that we setting up the the, the various you know the activities from the viewpoint of business, but not only business, but also some of the the total social problems. So how can share the goal? That's a very uh, important point. The uh, some uh, you know that the sharing of the goal will make in a more quick decisions and what's the other real benefit of the uh, through the digitalizations. So. We, we are now making a big effort to, to the, uh, how to utilize of the data, how to making a more clear goals for the futures. Mm -hmm. the, those and kind of the approaches that our taking. So. And do you think, so that's a lovely clear picture of the possibility of getting more information, more data. It's applying what Eric told us to decision making. Do you think that business can help government do that. So to, to address, for example, Japan's social issues, can business help with that? Can business help government be more agile in responding? And, and, and how? Uh, as for the other Japanese society, that's, uh, we have a lot of the uh, you know, that, uh, social issues. The first one is that uh, aging society, mm -hmm. decreasing the population, and also that very much uh, rapid increase of the social care, mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. the, those kind of things is how to manage of the future. It's uh, really the big issues. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, for example, that the aging society, mm -hmm. the currently that's a very long life, but uh, the most serious, you know, the issues, the people's uh, healthy life extensions, mm -hmm. not simply of the uh, physical life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very, very important point. But now in this case, what, what kind of the data? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a sometimes a personal one, but sometimes a very statistical analysis to, to making a more clear way to take care of the health, to, to keep up the healthy life. Mm -hmm. Those kind of the activities, uh, we can support it from the viewpoint, not only the health care business, but also some of the uh, so, so, social analytics based on the data. So focus business on ensuring that citizens who are going to live longer live healthier as yes. well. Yes, that so is a very typical example. Right. Mm. Well, th thank you very much. Um, could, could I say? Yes. I think it's a good issue for the uh, public part, uh, uh, private partnership. Mm -hmm. uh, we tried to start with this program for, with the Russian government, and uh, we tried to understand how many um, services the the public services uh, uses the normal, the normal citizen. Mm -hmm. It's uh, 48 services mm -hmm. which cover 80, more than 80% of the of needs of the normal citizen. Mm -hmm. It's not such a lot of uh, processes. We, sp we spoke about the processes there. Right. How long it takes for the government to g digitalize and redesign these processes? Mm -hmm. I think it. it it, it will take a lot of time. Mm -hmm. But we are very interested mm -hmm. on these services also, and we, we would like to bring these services to our customers. Mm -hmm. And we had a very interesting exper experiment with the mortgages. Mm -hmm. For example, the, uh, to get a mortgage from a bank, now it <coughs> takes maybe one week. Mm -hmm. But re registration of your property normally takes one month in, in, a, good, uh, in a good way. And uh, last year we, we, have a, we, we organized a small team together with uh, this agency who is responsible for, uh, for reg registration, small team from Sberbank and small team from this agency, and we have redesigned all the processes. And uh, for example, if you, if you look at Moscow and Moscow region, now the registration process take one day. So that's a great example of what you were saying, Carlos, of bringing the private sector together with the regulators, better explaining, clearing out the thing, points, points for an example of exactly what 
Nakanishi-san is suggesting to us about a partnership mm -hmm. for more agile governance. I'd like to turn to Kenneth Ross because Kenneth is in a different sector. He's executive director of Human Rights Watch. And how does this discussion of governance strike you, Kenneth? I mean, does it fill you with uh, fear and anxiety or great hopes for the world of human rights? Well, it's a mixed bag. I mean, let me pick up on a few of the topics that have been addressed. I mean, first with data. I mean, data is very powerful. And so we shouldn't be surprised that powerful interests sometimes get in the way of data collection. Mm -hmm. And just to cite one example, um, you would think that you know, in something like the United States, where you could really have 50 different experiments in gun control, state by state, mm -hmm. that you would want to know, just as a public health matter, um, which gun control regimes save more lives than others. You know, if you're the National Rifle Association, you say we want to put guns in people's hands because it's going to make it safer, so they can all, you know, stand in their house and prevent intruders. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, and others say no. You actually have this, you know, guns all over the place, and it makes us all more likely to shoot each other, and it's actually much less safe. Well, this is like a perfect thing for the Center for Disease Control, the leading public health mm -hmm. investigative agency, mm -hmm. you know, advisory agency to look at. But they're precluded from looking at it because. The key industry here, in this case, you know, the key interest group, doesn't want to know. Recruited by law. Yes. 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 You know. Right. So yep. it's an example of how, um, you know, a public-private partnership can go awry, mm -hmm. because in this case, the private interest has prevented the government from collecting data that actually would help address a serious public health challenge. Mm -hmm. Now, um, just to give a couple other examples. I mean, I'm. Um, you know, when we talk about agile government, these days, there's a tendency to equate that with deregulation. Mm -hmm. You know, that there's this sort of image put out there of, you know, these awful, burdensome regulations that are just, you know, tying business down. And government comes in and, you know, uses a, a you know, like a meat cleaver to chop through those horrible regulations and let business go and we're all going to be better off and the stock market rises and people are happy. You know, and then you start... Was that some reportage of the last month? No, sorry. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. last year, shall we say. Yeah. yeah. Um, <coughs> we'll probably hear some of this tomorrow. Yep. Um, but but um, the, um, then you start looking at some of these awful, awful regulations that are being chopped. And so, I mean, just to give two examples of, of you know, areas where my organization has been interested in promoting regulation, um, we've done, Human Rights Watch has done a lot of work on child tobacco workers. Because if you are you know, a kid picking tobacco, this is a dangerous thing. Because you know, one, it's like you're smoking several packs of cigarettes a day just by ingesting the nicotine. Second, you know, there's pesticide all over the place, which is poisonous. So, you know, kids actually often will put on, you know, sort of raincoats almost, despite the sweltering heat, to try to protect themselves. And it's obviously, it's a dangerous thing for kids to do. This is a big, awful regulation that is being attacked right now to try to say, no, this is not hazardous work. Let kids pick tobacco, mm -hmm. you know. Um, or to give another example, um, there is now in place a regulation that requires extraction companies to publish what they pay to governments where they extract minerals or oil or what have you. And this is being fought tooth and nail today. Why? You know, because these companies want to be able to pay off. You know, I mean, the reason for the regulation in the first place was that it was a way to avoid corruption. It was a way to avoid, you know, funding highly abusive security forces. Um, but suddenly, this is you know one of these terrible regulations that is they're trying to pare back. So, you know, I actually think when we, you know, agility sounds nice in the abstract, but but you really can't separate, you know, the speed of government, the the, the facility of government from the substance. And you've got to look at you know what is being chopped, what is being precluded, and what isn't. And you know, some regulations are good. Regulations are often the main thing that stands in the way of industries that are harming our health or harming our safety. Mm -hmm. And so we just have to look carefully. What are, yeah. what are your reactions around the room to this? Any, any thoughts, questions? Yep. I would love to ask to Hi, I'm, I'm Francisco. I'm a global shaper from Argentina, Cordoba. Um, we are facing this situation in Latin America. Governments are cutting regulations 
because they are trying to attract um, foreign, foreign investment. And because of this, we are facing this kind of shopping situation where companies side are trying to decide where to invest because of these regulations. So I think that is, is obviously jeopardizing human rights. I think that was a comment. Yeah. Any other comments around the room? Yes. Across here. Thank you, Aaron Maniam from the Singaporean government. Uh, I've been very struck by the attitudes to time that the panelists have talked about, because rather than try to compress time in agility of governance, what it seems you're saying is we need to actually oscillate between deep compression at some points and then at other times really uncompressing time and taking the space to experiment, to iterate, and to slow things down so that we can actually be responsive. I'm curious whether you think that's the right characterization or not. Thank you very much. There was another, I'm going to come back to you, Eric. There was another comment over here. No, uh, sorry, one, one moment, because there was somebody else who had their hand up that I, sorry, yes, right. I'm just struck by the, the contrast between public and private sector. So all the, you know, there's been this huge revolution in customer focused, agile, big tech and other industries that seems to be meeting customer needs well. And yet somehow on the democratic front where we had an institution which was supposed to be very customer or voter focused, we don't seem to be getting the same kind of performance out of the system. Um, I, I don't know, it's a tough one, but what, what's going on in that contrast? And is there a way to take some stuff from the private sector into the public on this one? Thank you very much. And, and the gentleman at the back. I'll make it very quick. Uh, I'll be very quick on this. Um, in 1994, a colleague and I wrote an article called Comparative Agility. And we argued that it wasn't good for every firm all of the time to be agile because there are expenses associated with being agile. So there are situations in which you need to kind of slow down, and there are some situations in which you can speed up. In some situations, you can have a lot of variety. In other situations, you may not be a good idea to have a lot of variety. Thank you very much. And, and down here. I just want to pick up on the subject of why agility has worked in the private sector and perhaps not in the public sector. And, and I think what the private sector has done well is it, is it has looked at the consumer and their needs. Now, if we look at the public sector, a regulatory idea often comes from the public officials that are coming up or a bunch of academics or a technology company or industry group. And they lobby and they try to get the thing going. The politicians, while respect that input, they are focused on the voters. And the technology companies, whether they are in the pharmaceutical industry or the tech industry, are all focused on lobbying, but they're not focused on actually demonstrating to the public that this is good for them. And they start demanding. So we don't close the loop. So there's two sides to, to, to this, is that we have to focus on the voters the consumers and the public who is going to benefit from this regulation and then the politicians are sandwiched from both ends and you will have the legislation. So your point, if I understand you, is that it's the corporate, the corporate sector's agility yeah. is actually making it more difficult no, for governments the, to be genuinely agile. No, they're the, lobbying and creating. Yeah, they're lobbying, but yeah. they're not investing the same amount of effort in getting the public to understand that what they're lobbying is good for them. Whereas in their own business, they actually listen to the consumer. They are totally focused on the consumer in expanding their business. But, but surely, yeah. sir, there's a big dif the, there's, yeah. there is a big difference. Yeah. And that's if you're producing things which customers can buy or not buy. It's easy. You've got a perfectly legitimate way of saying yeah. you can buy my iPhone or not. Yeah. It's your choice. Mm -hmm. If you're a government, you're making a decision that will, by necessity, create some winners and some losers. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And if you're making that decision on the basis of some private sector lobbying, that might not necessarily represent the public interest. No, and that's why you have to demonstrate to the public mm -hmm. that actually it is useful for vast majority of them. Yeah. Yeah, I think this, this is an important point. In other words, you know, a, a corporate lobbyist yeah. as opposed to a corporate marketer mm -hmm. is not appealing to the public. That's your point. Yeah, yeah that's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. and, and it is in our interest <laughs> to force that private lobbying mm -hmm. discussion mm -hmm. into the public domain. Mm -hmm because transparency would exactly. force there to be more of a conversation yeah, exactly about what's the in the public good. Exactly. And whereas if stuff happens all in the back room, mm -hmm. it is about you know, what's good yeah. for the profit, what's good for the company, but not necessarily what's good for the public. So you know, if we're setting up a system, the more transparency, the better. 
So we can we can nuance this about you know going too fast or too slow is better. I don't want to nuance it. I want to be really clear and say there's not there's a false dichotomy to say that you have to slow down to experiment. You can actually do experiments faster than the typical study does. There are many experiments that are done in, in days, even hours, on some of these platforms. And in many cases, you're going to be doing the, plat the implementation anyways. So I, I don't think that should be an excuse or that there should be a mindset that, oh, that's going to be slower. Um, in terms of should everyone oh, Eric, be more agile? Just on that, sorry, yes. yeah. if, I, if you can, yeah. don't forget the second thought. But sure. just in case we're all, others are thinking with me, when you say you can do it faster, do you mean Amazon AB or do you mean the Medicare example? Because you might I mean, not all of know. Them. Yeah, all but, of them. But if you're doing it fast, off, the mental health problems might not emerge till six months later and you've already moved to change the regulation. So, so first off, more and more companies are digital mm -hmm. and more and more co countries and uh, organizations are digital. So it's not just the Amazons that are digital. My, my, my friend Gary Loveman is CEO of... Uh, 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 Caesars Entertainment, he went to my PhD program with me and then went to a different route. Um, that company is mostly in law. They, they, have, they look at customer satisfaction and things. They found indicators that drive long-term sh shareholder value, long-term customer satisfaction that are much quicker. They can count how people are when they check out. How many, they found that how many times people were smiling in the, uh, in the pictures was an indicator. So they're finding ways of using data-driven methods that are predictive of me short, medium, and long-term um, outcomes, you know, and then and then you know, it, it's, it's certainly not it's not magic that uh, if something mental health takes longer to discover that it instantly makes it makes it discernible faster. Although I would say there's my colleagues at the MIT Media Lab are working on faster indicators of that. So, but but the question is, would you slow it down even more than it is today? Absolutely not. If anything, um, you can speed it up. So that that would be my, my my first point. The second point I just want to briefly get to was um, this draft. You know, should everyone be more agile? No, it, it, it's true that, that this doesn't work everywhere, but I would say that's the way to bet. <laughs> and in, in, my, in my book with Andrew McAfee, A Machine Platform Crowd, we talk about rebalancing. But again, I think for almost everyone in this room, they should be thinking about how can we be more agile? How can we be more data-driven? How can we be more experimental? How can we go faster? Uh, we did a survey um, with a US government partnership of uh, 30,000 uh, plants. And we did asked a bunch of questions about how data-driven they were, how agile they were, how quick they were making decisions. And the companies that were, in the, actually these at the plant level, that were more agile and more data-driven were about 4 to 5% more productive than the companies that weren't. Now, that didn't mean that every single one that was agile and data-driven was better than every single one that wasn't. But that was the broad message. This is a cultural change. The technology is there. And I think that the biggest barrier is that people aren't pushing hard enough. As, as Kenneth was saying, I mean, there, sometimes there are the Congress or, other, or CEOs or regulators are not letting people use the data that's available. So I would say unleash it, get moving faster, make that cultural shift to take advantage of uh, an amazing abundance that we have or we could have if we, if we wanted to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very some... important point. That mm -hmm. uh, data itself isn't talking a lot. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's not simply of the timing issues. Mm -hmm. The digitalization is uh, making it uh, various you know, the social uh, issues visible. Mm -hmm. Th those kind of things is a very key point. The how to manage of the time is a, a little bit different issues. The, before that, we need a share of the uh, issues, how to setting up the, the, such a problems. The, those kinds of the very transparent, open discussion can be done through the digitalization. Mm -hmm. That's a very important point. Thank you. And Carlos, so, you had a response. I had two, two comments, one in uh, the fast and slow and governments and countries and companies. I mean, countries are not companies, and there's countries that are go much more f fast than, uh, than companies. Look at Estonia. I mean, in Estonia, because they had the opportunities to start from scratch, Today, with one card, with your ID card, you can do everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can pay your taxes, you can go to the lawyer, you can buy a house, but they didn't have the legacy of the past. Mm -hmm. And that was an opportunity. And so other countries that have that legacy have to adapt, but they will go slowly. But you know what? I think if you look at uh, an economy of the 
countries that do really well, they have strong institutions. And that's why I wanted to go to the point of the, of the regulation. The tension that we leave now is that you're getting all these entrepreneurs that sometimes come to my office in Brussels, that they're getting into very regulated sectors. And you know what? Those sectors have to be regulated. Because if you're getting into health or education, I want to be sure that those sectors are regulated. The thing is that those entrepreneurs of these phase of the internet, that was a phase where you could be successful without talking to government, that phase is over. And so we are still trying to speak the same language with those people, and we don't speak the same language. And so I think there will be, from the governments, a need to adapt to that new world. But also, I can tell you, I mean, most of the entrepreneurs uh, that come to my office, they have no idea about what we do. They have no idea about what Europe does. And by the way, it's on data. I think that with a new law that uh, is coming into force from Europe on the protection of data, we're giving a big step in terms of what you're saying. We're giving to the people the power of owning their own data. And so you have to give consent for people to use your data. And it's not consent in a, in a very long form where companies just put you in a very small footnote what they're going to do. They have to be clear. And that is something that two years ago people were criticizing Europe. But you know what? Being in Europe, or even if you're outside of Europe, if you deal with Europe, you will have to respect that principle. And I think that's something that two years ago we were criticized, and today we are praised for it. So Kenneth raises, take us inside your office for a moment, Carlos, right? So Kenneth raises this issue that some private sector lobbyists are showing up at your office claiming that they want more agile governance, but really just seeking a change in the regulation that's going to advantage them perhaps over others, or that will have children to picking, picking tobacco more cheaply at their own peril. Do you see that? Do they... Are there some that knock on your door that, that you can see that that's what's coming? You know, how do, how do we translate what Candace said to your world where, where, where entrepreneurs line up to come and lobby you? So first of all, everyone that comes to see me is on a transparency registry sure. and, uh, and comes uh, to talk to me. But one of the things, I come from the private sector. And so when I went into politics, I thought that people would come to my office to tell me, cut off regulation, uh, just don't do it, let us go. You know what is exactly the contrary? <coughs> Most of the people come for you to create regulation to protect their businesses. Mm -hmm. So exactly, rent seekers, and everybody comes to you, and they never ask you to actually say no regulation. It's exactly the contrary. But I think that's where you have to co-create in the future more with people, to avoid people that come into lobbying you because they have their own interests. So how do you make people participate in that co-creation? You know, a little bit like the movement of user innovation that was created by Eric von Hippel in the MIT, which is a about innovation that comes from the work of all of us. Before Schumpeter thought, I mean, innovation uh, was about just uh, the push of the companies innovating it. It's not, it's the user, it's the people. But you have to create the systems for helping them to co-create with you. And I'm a big believer uh, on that kind of politics. So we're getting to, <coughs> sorry. Yeah, you... I was just gonna add, I mean, just to add a little complexity about this relationship between data and regulation, mm -hmm. because um, let me give an example um, of the, the use of bail in a criminal case. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, bail, in theory, um, you're supposed to get bail, meaning you, you know, pay a certain amount and you just promise to come back to court, unless you're you know, a risk of flight or you're a risk of violence. And what we found, um, and I think it's widely understood, is that judges actually look at the skin color of the suspect. And you know, in the United States, an African American or a Latino American is more likely to have a bail set higher than they can afford, and therefore is stuck in custody pre-trial, is under much more pressure to plead guilty, they have a criminal conviction, there's this you know, series of bad consequences that result. So there's been this effort now to introduce data into this, which is, I think, you know, positively motivated. Mm -hmm. And there are algorithms that have been developed they, and the judges can look at the algorithm as a way of getting past their personal bias. Mm -hmm. But then the problem is, what data goes into the algorithm? Mm -hmm. Well, in fact, you know, data from the last five years, where the police have already been focusing their energies on you know, African-American and Latino neighborhoods. And so you find that the data, in some ways, is just as biased as the judges. And you need to regulate the use of that data 
um, constantly tests the algorithm, which is easier to do with a, an open public algorithm than a proprietary algorithm, um, to try to pull the bias out of the data. Because overall, I think the use of these algorithms is a good thing, because pure human subjectivity does tend to be racist or biased in various ways, but so is data. Um, data you know, isn't necessarily neutral. And so you have to, you know, yes, I mean, by all means, we should be data driven, but you've got to scrutinize the data. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we've got to, you know, I sat at the beginning of this session wondering to what problem is agile governance a solution other than the need for us all to call whatever we do by a new name that we all share? You know, so, so what problem are we trying to solve here? And I think the discussion has highlighted three, three promises of agile governance. One, faster. So the problem that our decisions, whether it's in the private sector, the 40% in Herman's bank that are, are not yet agile, um, getting them to move faster. And as Eric points out, to keep up with technology. The second is the customer focus that you spoke about, Herman. How we can be more customer focused or citizen focused. And where I think being more citizen focused actually takes you a little more time. That you don't want to use one off red for referenda to know what your citizens think. To actually consult and know what your citizens um, need is a, is a much longer exercise. And the third is this idea of mixed teams, which has come out in, in uh, both Akanishi-san and Herman Greff's comments, of where you've got a problem and you need the ability not to run it through every process of your government or your organization, but to put your SWAT team on it, to put a mixed team on it, and to find a solution quickly. Is that, is that where you all see agile governance? Is that the problem that we're trying to solve, governance that is just unnecessarily cumbersome? I think that's a great list. I, I would add two other <laughs> things to the list that are maybe, you know, it's, the, the, a, a fourth one would be uh, personalization and, and specificity of your recommendations. Without the, the agility, you tend to have one size fits all solutions and sort of mass production, mass marketing, but um, it's, there's the potential not only in time to be more agile, but also across individuals. And different people have different needs, whether they're voters or citizens um, or um, uh, beneficiaries or customers. And, and there's a promise to do that, too. The second one, I just want to underscore something that's sort of come out a couple times here, but I, I think it's worth, worth bringing up to another level, which is that, uh, that data and agility is the enemy of rent seeking and lobbying, and that if it's done right, you're able to uh, make sure things are more transparent and that whether it's the voters or the customers or the people in the organization can, can bring sunlight to what's happening. And that also is a, a very big part of the benefit. I think very often the, the desire to, to slow things down or gum things up is to, is to preserve rents and not really to be more, um, more agile. But, but that just to challenge that a little, mm, sure. that's not the experience of a lot of us in this room who discovered that the data, the agility on transparent websites has led to us the fact that when I go on Breitbart News, I get different news to when you go on Breitbart News. Maybe. I, don't go on, I don't go on Breitbart News. <laughs> but because their algorithm is telling them what we like and dislike, mm -hmm. that that's going on without us being aware of it, that, that we're being fed... Well, the answer is more, more visibility, not, not less visibility. The answer is, is more data. It's for us to be able to, to own our own data, to see what's happening, for them to have to share the algorithms, and for us to have some visibility into it. So I think that's, that's a, a good example of, of what I'm trying to uh, describe here. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Carlos? Absolutely. I think that the problem of um, having the good data that you referred to and having enough data uh, and having the transparency of the algorithms is essential for the future mm -hmm. because today you don't know uh, it's like a black box and you kind of think that it's because it's a black box what gets out of there is something that makes sense and sometimes as you're saying Kenneth it doesn't make any sense do we have anyone in the room who writes algorithms any techies yep. brilliant tell us can you really explain an algorithm um, if you would make the... that transparent to everybody else in the room, would any of us actually understand any of it? Uh, well, I think algorithms are nothing but a set of rules put in a hypothesis with the data coming in and some outcome coming out. And uh, the trick question that we landed in, in this conversation is when government starts to get a ton of data about their citizen, they become owners just like in private organizations are, and then we have issues with Facebook and Google knowing way too much what happens when government knows way too much and crosses the boundary? Mm -hmm. 
that is the trick of the counter statement around that. So algorithms of data collections or algorithm decision making uh, can effectively make the optimum decisions towards whatever the trick that you want it to be, but that will be such a fiasco any which way. Inclusiveness will be an out non an outcome of it. And of course, governments are already making that argument in the name of personalization. You're, we're going to have all your data. We're going to know what you're doing, what you're thinking, what you're buying, because then we can cater to you better. So there is a real tension in that. Um, there was a comment here. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just and, accept the issue is not about understanding algorithm, because this is the company's competitive advantage. They're not going to tell you how they do it. But I want to pick up on Carlos' point that you... Yeah, sorry. We yeah, yeah. So you point. have said that you have now right to use information, but... We need more than that. We, not, we need revenue sharing from platform companies with two-sided market that Eric has so lucidly illustrated in his new book. Now, there are technologies appearing that will allow you to have a third party validate where the data that I used was used by a company without exposing their algorithm in a decision that led to some revenue for which I should get a micropayment. Okay. Now, you don't have to legislate it, but the tech the right to use, you have done that. But that doesn't help, because I all still want to give my data to Facebook and, like, you know, it's not going to stop me from giving the data. But what we need, in addition to regulation, is technology that allows us to know that our data was used and I want a part of the revenue that the company did. Thank because you very much. Mm -hmm. And last question very from Paul. Comment. comment from Paul. I think just to... Uh, uh, two things, uh, and and uh, and I don't know which direction we'll take this conversation on on agility. Generally, all citizens and all of us begin in a society appreciating being treated like a market, so individualized, personalized, and whatever. But sooner or later, we realize that we don't want to be treated like a market. We want to be treated like like human beings, and human beings mean we are looking for cohesion. And so for me, what I'm not hearing coming out of here is, uh, is, is what has happened to, we all wanted Amazon to do this and it was so nice and river, but before long they started tweaking the data a little bit and they started shaping our behavior and they, they, they started predicting what we should do. And it reached a point where they now have the power to decide what we do and what we can do, do and we are stuck. But we seem to be wanting to drive governments to that direction. Where is the place of the individual saying, I still want to remain me, not to be a market? And where there is the place of the cohesion where I still want to be us, not to still be uh, and whatever, an individual treated like a market? Beautifully put point. Yeah. Can I come back to the audience for the last word on this? Um, at the beginning of the session, I said, how many of you want agile governance? Everybody put up their hands. Let's do the vote again. How many of you want agile governance? Yeah, so still, still a lot of people. But, and how many of you now want to put some if buts on it? If and buts. Here are some conditions that I want to put on it. So, so quite a few people wanting to put a few conditions around it. Can you all join me? I wish we could continue the debate. A last time is up. But I'd love you to join me in thanking our fantastic speakers for taking a word that's been in Davos for the last three days and making sense of it for us. So thank you so much to each of you.